Welcome to the Global Health Education Summit focused on the innate immune system. It is January 2021, and I can't help but feel like we are at this extraordinary tipping point of human history. For the first time in our history, we are under a mass campaign to genetically modify our species. We are lining up to inject a messenger RNA, a piece of genomic information that will change the protein synthesis within our body for the very first time in our history. If you've come to know me through much of my work in the food and agricultural system, then you know we've worked for the last decade to really pioneer this intersection between human health and, and ecological health. At the intersection of food and agriculture, we find this argument of genetically modified foods as a future versus as a, the greatest existential threat to our species. And our work around Roundup and glyphosate and its interaction with the human barrier systems that we call the tight junctions and its erosion of our gut lining, vascular lining, blood brain barrier, kidney tubules so that Roundup has induced has given us a, a forefront look at something called the innate immune system. If you missed any of our materials leading up to this event, I strongly encourage you to review some of that in uh, re retrospect after listening through today's seminar. You're gonna do well to listen to the 12 minute piece that's available on the innate immune system landing page on zachbushmd.com, as well as tap into the Instagram short version of that if you, if you don't have time for the full 12 minutes there. There's a shorter version on Instagram of that uh, overview of the innate immune system. And then our blog content, the newsletter that went out earlier in the month, reviewing the different layers of the innate immune system as it relates to these barrier systems of the tight junctions, the microbiome, uh, the bacteria and fungi, and how they interact with, with our uh, environment within us and outside of us, as well as the deeper levels of the innate immune system in regards to cellular responses. Far downstream of the innate immune system is the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is, is getting 99% of the attention these days and when it comes to the discussion around public health. This is unfortunately very antiquated in its belief, belief system and is frankly scientifically erroneous based on some very simple facts that you've perhaps even witnessed this past year and also just the extraordinary health and vitality within a seven day old infant. Amazingly, we don't actually develop the adaptive immune system within our bodies until three to six months after birth. These adaptive immune systems produce antibodies to downstream proteins and other potentially external forces to keep us in balance with the world around us. At one time, we believed that the innate, this adaptive immune system that was responsible for sterilizing the human body, but that was a very antiquated perspective that became false as far back as 20 years ago, as we started to realize the microbiome within the human body was in a constant relationship with it. And in the last 10 years, to find out that every compartment within our bodies, including even our, the hallowed blood brain barrier and uh, the central nervous system of our brain is teeming with microorganisms that are there not only to promote health in the moment to moment, but also be there as an adaptive force to help us overcome injury. And so this microbiome is now understood to be part of us, which then challenges the belief that our, our adaptive immune system and immunology of antibodies was ever there to sterilize us because it wasn't. If we were sterile, we would die immediately. The reality is we have to stay in conjunction with, in relationship to this vast system of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, parasites, and even the virome, the massive genomic sea that we live within. In that seven day old infant that I just mentioned, there's 10 to the eighth, more than a billion viruses per gram of stool in that child's uh, gut system interacting with its immune system that lies primarily in the gut. Amazingly, that child at seven days of age has no problem maintaining relationships to these billions of viruses, despite the fact that there is no adaptive immune system present to make an antibody to any of those. And so by that simple data point, we know that we are wrong about the fact that pandemics, our response to pandemics, our adaptive capacity to recover from pandemics has nothing to do ultimately with our adaptive immune system and our ability to make antibodies. It is a misbelieved system that is based on over a hundred year old uh, paradigm of science that again believed that sterility was the only pathway to human health. The revolution that we are in the midst of, the massive paradigm shift that is one of the biggest scientific discoveries of humankind is that human health does not reside within the human cell. 
Human health is dictated instead by the biodiversity that is at the center of our vitality. Biodiversity at the microbiome and the genomic information from the virome is how we adapt. It is the gain of function capacity of the human biology and biology of the planet as a whole. The way in which we came to be as mammals, let alone as humans, was through the intelligent design of the virome's capacity to create plasticity and a creativity within that thing we call life. And so it is with great passion and a sense of import that I want to bring to you this panel today of the innate immune system discussion so that we can start to wrap our ideas of how do we get here to this point that an 100 year old belief system in sterility and adaptive immune system and antibodies is now a multi-trillion dollar endeavor that is shutting down economies globally and fueling massive wealth within the hands of a few for this very antiquated scientific belief. And so we're going to dive into this effort. We're going to look deeper into this experience of the innate immune system and what it means, how we got here, and how we can think differently about human health than waiting for the genetic modification of our species to make some viral protein from our cells. It is time for us to take our health back inside. We, we have an opportunity to make some critical decisions for our health, our human health, our family's health, our, our planet as a whole right now as we start to just check in with our common sense, check in with our intuition to, to really wonder, are we really waiting for multi-billion dollar technology companies in the form of pharmaceutical companies or beyond to deliver us health? Or was health innate to the human experience hundreds of thousands of years ago when we emerged from this sea of life that we call the planet of Earth? When we emerged from that life, were we somehow deficient and just hoping and, and holding on to life, clinging to, to life, just waiting for the pharmaceutical industry to be developed, just waiting for technology to break through to show us how to kill everything around us, how to protect us from that one virus out of the 10 to the 31 that we will have in our air this year, or the 10 to the 30 that is in the soil beneath our feet, or in the 10 to the 31 viruses that are in the ocean itself. Are we really against it all, or are we the result of it all? And so as we dive into the native immune system, I'm excited for you to just hold on, strap in, you're going to get a big download here, but I guarantee you this is such new information and such a different way of looking at human biology than you've been become used to in this public narrative that has dominated the human sphere this last year. It's going to take some time. So let it sink in, revisit the innate immune system website, rewatch that little 12 minute video, that synopsis that I gave you, sink into this reality that we are not dependent or hoping for some technologic breakthrough for our species to survive. Instead, we are waiting to align human creativity, our technologies, our consumer products, and everything else with the biology we live within. So with no further ado, I get to introduce to you one of the most extraordinary panels out there. The innate immune system uh, is waiting to be divulged here from a multi-perspective standpoint. Coming to you first is Dr. Cindy Fallon, a PhD in organic chemistry. She spent 25 years with DuPont, and it's her extraordinary experience of working alongside amazing people in these chemical industries that are somehow kept away from the big picture of the damage and harm that is done to environments, people themselves, through the use of these chemicals. Over her tenure, she was involved in the rollout of over 400 consumer products over that 25 years and was, was very integrally uh, involved in all of the FDA and regulatory processes that allowed those to come to market. And so an extraordinary expose on the industry there and a look at how humans can be led into narrow pathways of belief that allow us to make extraordinary mistakes in, in regards to, to public health and biologic health on the planet. Next up after her will be Dr. John Gilday, one of my great mentors and colleagues John has really broken out the, the whole concept of the innate immune system over the last decade in our laboratories at, at Biomic Sciences. He has uh, been very responsible for showing us this extraordinary world of the microbiome's communication network and its capacity to interface with the tight junction system, the barrier system that is inherent to this thing that we call the innate immune system. That first line of defense, the tight junctions fall apart in the face of glyphosate and are put back together through the power of the microbiome and its communication network. And so John uh, got to that through an extraordinary uh, winding pathway that took him from 
detection of germ warfare from in the military all the way to uh, genomic detection through the first PCR tests that has become so relevant uh, to the world this year, uh, all the way to uh, research and forefront uh, understanding of exosomes and the way in which we exude genomic information from our bodies, how we send biromics out of our bodies to interact distantly with other organ systems within us, as well as other individuals and other organisms uh, far outside of our body. And so as an expert in microRNA, which is kind of the new field of epigenetics, uh, he brings extraordinary insights there as well. Next up is Dr. Lee Cowden, MD, a cardiologist, uh, one of the forefathers and for front runners in the integrative medicine world. Dr. Cowden is the president of the Association of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine globally. He and his network are now over 4,000 physicians in over 16 different countries uh, around the world. And we get to see the, the wealth of information coming back from all those 4,000 practitioners globally, bringing back indigenous wisdoms as well as integrative wisdoms that have been around for thousands of years uh, to bring us into a realization that it is not technology we're waiting for, but an open mind and open ears and open eyes of humanity to look back to nature for our solutions. Next up will be Dr. Peter Cummings. Uh, Dr. Cummings is an extraordinary uh, triple board certified neuropathologist. He's been a, a part of some of our previous global health uh, summits, and you, you'll get to hear from him the extraordinary new science around the gut brain axis, not in regards just to the neurons and the neural interactions there, but the immune system itself and how the innate immune system within the brain and the peripheral nervous system of the gut really functions in league with these other elements of the innate immune system. So once again, excited to introduce all these and, and have you uh, hear from them. And we'll wrap up the end with some follow-up that will direct you to more resources so that you can refresh this and share this with everybody you know. Without further ado, I am so glad to have you, Dr. Fallon. Please introduce yourself uh, in regards to your long and winding career that brings you to this day where we honor the innate immune system from your perspective. Thank you so much for joining us. Zach, uh, I really appreciate you including me in this, and I'm looking forward to the conversation and uh, happy to be a part. So thank you. Um, after I got my degree in organic chemistry, I spent 25 or more years at DuPont, and I was in global technology leadership, innovation, new product development. I was associated with hundreds of chemical product launches in biosecurity, disinfection in animal health and human health. So these were very regulated spaces. So I had teams of people, teams of regulatory experts working side by side with formulators, trying to navigate products from concept to commercialization and riding those really fine uh, regulatory lines. And I think herein lies one of the basic flaws in the system. Um, as good people working in industry, we trust the process. So we play by the rules and therefore we believe we're doing what's right. And the problem is we've confused doing what's legal with doing what's right. And I think that's a common theme you'll, you'll hear me go back to. Um, since the earliest days of my career, I had been on a health journey, starting with a debilitating case of fibromyalgia at age 30. And anyone that has fibromyalgia is very familiar with the extreme, the pain but I had also lost the mobility in my, my upper body. So I turned to the literature and I learned to manage it with uh, this ultra disciplined routine of exercise, like distance running and diet. I tend to think of it, I turned into my own little serotonin factory and it worked really well until about age 50, about seven years ago. So um, the regime didn't change, but it just stopped working. So not only did I have a significant relapse in fibromyalgia, I developed severe hypothyroidism, extreme eczema around the eyes, the arms, the legs, and um, debilitating allergies, particularly to dust mites. So I was washing the sheets every day. Um, so I was in this really painful downward spiral. Again, I turned to the literature and I learned about gut health. Thank you, Zach and team. And, um, and its connection to all these disorders that I was experiencing. And it was the first time in my life I realized what I put in my body actually matters, not, not just the food, but what's hidden within it. And simply by minimizing my exposure to the food toxins and tending to my gut, so 
non-GMO, iron gut health, organic as much as I could. Um, my hypothyroidism was gone. I went from a TSH of 48 down to five. My eczema's gone, my allergies are gone, and the fibromyalgia symptoms have subsided or gone. So I was inadvertently destroying my own health by consuming the toxins that came from the very company that had employed me for 25 years. And the irony of that was not lost on me. I, I began my next journey of trying to help good people in industry pause long enough to connect the dots and see the role that industry is playing in the health crisis. There, those of us in industry have, have spent our career thinking that the products we introduce, the benefits of the products we introduce outweigh the risks. None of us joined corporate America to undermine human health. So, so how does this, how does this happen? How does industry um, cultivate this culture of people thinking they're doing good and not seeing their connection to planetary health? Well, the industry is, you know, they employ very effective tactics um, to recruit and maintain allegiance rewarding royalty, positioning our company as the best suited to deal with the necessary evils that come along with innovation. Um, but I'll, I'll speak tonight, today, about um, just one, embracing skepticism, because I think it's so relevant today. Uh, companies will hire ghostwriters and front groups, I'm sure you know this, to, to be sure that there's an argument supporting the use of a particular chemistry or technology in, a, in an easily searchable way. So if you Google GMOs, you're gonna get a ton of positive um, discussion about how wonderful they are and they're gonna feed the world. This clouds the water enough so any disparaging data can be thrown out. And casting doubt allows us to dismiss any data that makes us um, uncomfortable as simply conspiracy. And it's not just casting down on data, but on people. You know, they're, they're fringe, they're hippie, um, good intent, but they're just not operating from a position of sound science. And embracing skepticism is done in plain sight at a massive scale. Um, an example of this is PFAS, perfluoroalkyl substances such as those found in Teflon. I remember when it first came to light that something in Teflon was under scrutiny, I didn't know what to think but I didn't have to think because the talking points came very quickly. We were given all the messaging. You'd have to totally abuse a Teflon pan, heat it far beyond anything a normal person would for much longer. And they had data to support that. So we could cling to extreme misuse conditions. And that cast enough doubt on the claim that we could write off anything negative that we were hearing about Teflon when in fact, the real issue wasn't even surfaced. The fact that PFAS chemicals and intermediates were getting into groundwater, industrial discharge was killing livestock and sickening people. There was no discussion of PFAS and fast food wrappers migrating into greasy foods and into the bloodstreams of over 95% of all as US citizens. Um, so the, the problem was much more pervasive and had little to do with the issue of overheating a Teflon pan. But it didn't matter. We, we were given the message that helped us cast doubt on anything that those overzealous activists might claim as they grab for money out of corporate pockets. So the tactic is incredibly effective because we're given an alternate story we can cling to. Another um, key premise we buy into early in our career that I think can lead us astray is that Regulatory agencies are designed to be gatekeepers. And as long as we play by the rules of these agencies, we're being responsible stewards. So it's again, if it's legal, it's right. Um, but regulatory agencies like the EPA, FDA, in spite of being filled with really smart people of good intent, are currently designed to fail in their mission to protect public health and environmental health. It's just not how they're measured. It starts with a lack of separation of powers. The president appoints the head of these agencies. So they directly serve the executive branch. These agencies also write legislation and they enforce legislation. So you've got the executive, judicial and legislative branches. 
colliding and you give industry full access at all levels. So it's, it's perfectly set up for corruption. The EPA and the FDA have been giving the unenviable task of writing a playbook that is palatable to industry so that they can keep the peace. So the industry has become the client and the pressures on the FDA to appease industry only increased with PDUFA, which is the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. It was a law passed in 1992, which allowed the FDA to collect fees from drug manufacturers to fund the new drug approval process. So now the FDA is under simultaneous and countervailing pressures to both speed up approval and ensure safety of new drugs. So the EPA can't help but look at industry as their client instead of the public. Uh, now that pharma underwrites over half of the FDA's budget for scientific reviews. So their role has been become get as many drugs out as possible. And I, you know, they've been successful in that measure. I think the review process went from like 24 months down to eight and a half in 2015 with a 95% approval on first try. And I suppose I should be happy about a faster approval, but it would appear there might be a conflict of interest. Furthermore, how about a government that focuses on changing the trajectory of health in this country, getting at root cause so that we don't need as many pharmaceuticals? I just think that we have lost sight, lost sight of the mission. That's the FDA. So the EPA, the EPA's hands are also tied. There is an overwhelming amount of studies out there showing current levels of exposure to pesticides, for instance, induce health, negative health outcomes and severe impact on the immune system, just as I experienced personally. Um, but many of these would not be detected in the traditional toxicology tests that are accepted by regulatory authorities. The fact that these data don't fit typical experimental protocols doesn't make the data invalid. In fact, the EPA comes right out and admits that several studies have tested herbicide formulations, including Roundup, for mutagenic and genotoxic potential. And they say, although positive responses have been reported, the testing systems used may not be adequate for regulatory purposes because, quote, Routes of exposure vary from the required testing protocols. So you must follow an existing protocol and to get a change in protocol takes an act of Congress. I'd like to maybe later if we have time specifically talk about the EPA and immunotoxicity test requirements. But the bottom line is the testing protocols just haven't changed at pace with our understanding of the immune system and root cause of disease. So I think it's time to untie the hands of the EPA so that they can look at all available data, peer review data, use their good judgment. Um, ethically, of course, we can't do a double blind clinical trial and ex purposely expose people to toxins and monitor. But if um, truthfully, we are willfully exposing people all the time so the world has become an experiment and a big Petri dish. So let's at least use that data and not ignore it. Cindy, we're uh, together uh, presenting data to the EPA on glyphosate and its toxicity to human biology uh, and animal biology uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago now. And they came back with um, some extraordinary statements around um, why they couldn't consider our, the data that we were presenting. And our whole team that extended far beyond you and I presented over 96 uh, human studies and animal studies showing the toxicity of glyphosate to, to mammalian biology and the like. And uh, the most damning stuff that we demonstrated was the generational data. And I was just dumbstruck at the end of that, that they said that it had become illegal a couple of years ago for the EPA to consider generational toxicity data. And so somebody actually had the, the forward you know, view on, we need to hurry up and pass some legislation that 
doesn't allow scientists to submit data on generational toxicity of these common compounds. So it's just extraordinary, as you say, how it's very hard for us to bring the current regulatory mandates or the regulatory processes of determining toxicity, whether it be ge genetic toxicity or immune system toxicity, those haven't been updated since the discovery of the microbiome and its role in the immune system and genetics and everything else. And in the same way, we keep seeing blocking legislation such that when new data starts to come to light, they seem to be able to get to the legislative system before the data can to preempt the ability of the APA to hear that. And so I was struck by both of that process and by the humanity that was still on that EPA board. We saw members there on the EPA that couldn't look us in the eye throughout the presentation and kind of followed us out into the parking lot with a sense of, of shame, shame a little bit there, but more just a sense they, they wanted to, to say, keep going, keep, keep showing us the data. Because right now our hands are tied, but maybe in the future our hands will be untied. So please keep coming back with the data. So there's members of that EPA board that are so true to their humanity and true to their science and are doing the best they can and want the truth to come to light. And so in the same way that you're showing us the humanity of those that are working at DuPont or 3M or uh, Dow or Pfizer or Merck or beyond, there are such good people with such good intentions that are working in every university and every regulatory group and every, and it is the system put in place that allows for the corruption to continue to occur on these things. So uh, what an inc incredible journey. Can you give us just you know a sense of where you see uh, the biggest change could be made as consumers, how we could most participate in a revolution to this process? Is there a, a way that we could participate in that? Yeah, I, I think um, ultimately the consumer needs to embrace their power because they really have so much power and they can do that by getting involved. Uh, there's so many ways to get involved these days, you know, whether it's farmer's footprint, uh, herbicide free campus, non-toxic neighborhood, green lifestyle network bombs across America. There's just tons, um, but you can change your purchasing patterns. Um, I, I've been trying and I like conveniences as much as the next person, but I'm trying to envision that my fingerprints are on everything that I buy. So, and those fingerprints follow the product all the way to the grave. It sounds hokey, I know, but if I purchase a sunscreen that contains oxybenzone instead of zinc oxide, not only are my fingers, fingerprints on the bottle, but they're also all over the crime scene that is now the bleached coral reefs. On, um, you know, by contrast, if I purchase from a regenerative farmer, um, my arms embrace them and say, thank you for regenerating the soil. Thank you for rebalancing carbon. Thank you for allowing me to put food on the table that's not poisoning my family. So I, I think we have to each challenge our individual belief systems. Mine was very much um, better living through chemistry. You know, I was raised in the DuPont family. It, it ran deep and I spent a lifetime and a career reinforcing that, that I could improve life through chemistry. Um, until I had this strong wake up call uh, with my own health and allowed me to embrace an alternative, a world where rather than killing or controlling, uh, we're supporting nature to do what she's designed to do and frankly does much better than we could ever do with a test tube, right? So, um, I mean, I think that's why I'm glad we're here today with this kind of discussion because everyone needs to weigh their options and view of their own circumstances, listen before acting, and um, you know, own it. So I, I do think that the consumer has the power to to influence much greater than they ever imagined. It's extraordinary. It's beautiful. I was just you know walking through a, a store the other night, um, picking up some odds and ends for the household. And once you start to adopt this understanding that the cooking pans being a good example of it there with the, the Teflon, but the plastics and everything else in there with the endocrine disruptors through and through and you start to really see it through that lens you realize stores as large as you know costco or target or any of these places are having a very hard time delivering anything to your plate that hasn't been touched by these chemical industries and those chemical industries have infiltrated the clothes you're wearing the plastics that are in them the food that's on your table the lining of the, the, the aluminum can you know, it just goes on and on and on as to how many of these chemicals are touching your daily life. 
uh, you know, Teflon now thought to be in 99.5% of the bloodstream of all animals on earth, including humans is pretty extraordinary. You know, the, the idea of the way in which these chemicals have infiltrated beyond our CPG, you know, consumer product goods to be in our very ecosystems. And, you know, 75% of the, the rainfall in the United States measured is, is measuring positive for glyphosate and Roundup now. So uh, it, it's become so steeped in the human experience to be surrounded by these, these chemicals that inherently disrupt our innate immune system and our endocrine systems uh, to really lead to the epidemic of disease we see today. Uh, very good. Uh, any last thoughts, Cindy, before we move on? I would just say the, you know, as, as far as glyphosate, we, we didn't start measuring glyphosate until 2016. So the EPA sets the speed limit, FDA is supposed to enforce it. This has been registered since, was it 84 or 74? It's in, yeah, 74 it's, was it's, in, yeah. it's in our bodies, it's in our bones, up to 30 ppm in people's bones from, you know, for it to be that pervasive and we're not measuring it until 2016. It, the system supports process, the system supports industry, the system supports jobs, it supports status quo, but it does not support transparency and data and it does not support getting to the truth. I think, you know, once you pull back the curtain, and see the wizard is just a person. They're not all knowing, they're not infallible, and they might not even have my best interest at heart. You can't unsee that. And it falls to the individual to take responsibility. Amazing. Thank you, Cindy, for your courage of transforming your career and pivoting a career. That after 25 years, it would have been so easy for you to finish up uh, with that, but to pivot and take a strong, strong stand for, for who, you, who you are and who you believe in is a really great demonstration to all of us of how we can participate beyond just the choices we make. Who do we work for? Who, who, what are the systems that we support in our daily activities, whether it be through our buying patterns or our working patterns? And so for all of you listening, there's an opportunity for us to look at this recent, you know, pandemic narrative to realize the United States is sicker than any other country in the world, reporting a far greater mortality than any other country in the world with this pandemic. And so if we are the sickest nation, you know, we are the sickest and in, in, uh, developed nation, developed economy for sure. We're dead last in all developed economies for health outcomes. And uh, globally, we, we rank somewhere between 35 and 50, depending on which list you look at as to health outcomes. And that puts us behind a lot of developing nations and war-torn nations even having better health outcomes than us. And so we, we need to take a really critical look because if we believe in homeland security, if we believe in the United States of America and things like that, then we need to start to, to, to think much differently about what we're doing. For all of you listening from abroad, I would make a, a call to action on your side to make sure you don't do what the United States has done. You know, please take a look at the mistakes we've made at our regulatory levels, at, at our legislative levels and at our consumer behavior levels and try not to export human be American behavior and uh, maintain your cultures, maintain your culture around food. Uh, Europe, please uh, continue to push back towards your, your cultural respect and gratitude for the food that, that you share together. Uh, South America, please uh, do not feel the need to compete uh, with American producers. Uh, you guys are going to become the most valuable producers in the world over the next few years if you can go back to your, your cultural roots of food production. 70% of uh, the world today is fed by a peasant farmer. We honor all of you peasant farmers as, as has been termed. What that really means is an independent farmer. 70% of the world is fed by an independent farmer. So we honor all of you in your independence, in your resilience, in, in your hard work every day in feeding the world around you. And so thank you, Cindy, for that extraordinary uh, demonstration and uh, expose on the system there. Thank you for your revolutionary mindset and behavior. I want to turn now to Dr. John Gilday, PhD in uh, microbiology and genomics. And uh, Dr. Gilday, thank you for being with us. Uh, you are such a, a extraordinary teacher in my life. You've opened my eyes over and over again. Uh, Dr. Gilday uh, helped uh, reveal uh, the cancer world in special ways to me when I was doing chemotherapy research at the University of Virginia. He became my microscopy uh, consultant and he taught me immunofluorescence techniques for looking at protein synthesis inside cancer cells and the like and uh, became a really important part of, of my early success in that space. And it was a joy to reconnect with him after leaving the university. 
I've asked Dr. Gilday to give us a very personal uh, journey today with his scientific career and to represent his own personal experience rather than uh, the perspective of the University of Virginia or anything else. So this will be his personal experience and personal insights that he'll be sharing with us today and has no, uh, no reference back to university or, or the university's opinion on public health or science. Uh, so Dr. Gilday, thank you for uh, being with us. Thank you for being such a close friend and colleague and, and mentor to me over the years. Uh, can you give us a sense of how you ended up here in this conversation today? What was your long and winding road that's taking you through so many segments of this topic of the innate immune system and the biome at large? Yeah, thanks for the awesome introduction. Um, once in a while, they let me out of, uh, out of my lab to try and talk to the outside community. Um, I'm the person that spends all day at the bench and uh, it's a really good uh, opportunity to get out there and try and um, speak more in general um, with general information uh, that I may be able to convey. Uh, so my journey is kind of a kind of a strange one, and uh, I guess I would I would start it with right after my uh, college training. Uh, I went pre med, but. I fell in love with science my last couple of years and ended up uh, designing my own courses and, and teaching uh, the last couple of years and uh, decided I want to look into this science thing and uh, went out into industry first. And the first job I, I got was in a uh, diagnostic lab uh, working for the army. And this lab was designed to detect uh, all the retroviruses and a lot of the parasites that um, uh, army, the army would contract during their travels around the world. So I would collect those samples and um, grow them up in the lab and make positive controls for them and to try to defend, uh, develop uh, sensitive tests for those, uh, for those pathogens. So um, developed a lot of those uh, first PCR tests or for viruses, so that's kind of relevant these days. Um, I did that way back in um, uh, 1990, and uh, so that that beginning of interest in virology was was uh, was important to my development. Uh, from there, uh, because I developed a lot of sen sensitive tests, my next my next job was to uh, develop uh, tests for a uh, germ warfare testing facility also for the army. And this was, uh, I was tasked with the job of developing um, a test for airborne pathogens that had to be detected in 90 seconds from, from the air. And so that kind of stretched the limits of the ability to, to test for pathogens. Um, that was a really, really fun uh, development project. And uh, I guess the relevant information that I think convey from that was um, the beauty of, of realizing the design of the human body, how amazing it is, is we actually imitated the human nose in order to get those virus particles impinged on the liquid in order to do that test. Um, the turbinates in the nose are designed to make high flow air um, connect into a liquid surface and capture those particles. Uh, whereas um, mesh work, small meshwork is not able to capture the particles efficiently, especially the smaller particles. So um, that, that uh, design there of capturing particles uh, can't be overestimated in that uh, you know, the way your nose is designed and the way that uh, your outside world and your inside world interact um, is uh, really pretty amazing. Can I, uh, can I put, put a fine point on that as far as, you know, translating that a little bit? Uh, we have so much discussion around the N95 mask and all of these masks that the world is being asked to use, but these are made of the same meshes that you found to be incapable of capturing the viruses you were trying to, trying to capture out of the air. Is it, and then it sounds like in that inefficiency of, of a mesh to be able to capture viruses, you found that the most effective way to capture a virus would be to uh, breathe it through the nose. And so 
it, it sounds as if what we would do best from a public health standpoint would be to put people out into the world with, if 100% of people had a healthy nose on the front of their face instead of a mask on in front of their face, they'd be more capable of capturing viruses before they enter the lung per se. Is that is that an accurate you know, real life application there? Yeah, that was sort of the realization is that, uh, is that you know, a, a quick healthy test is to, if you just relax, you know, where you're sitting right now, you know, with your mouth closed, you know, is, is your tongue touching the roof of your mouth? Um, and are you breathing through your nose? And, and there's a really simple test to see if you are breathing correctly. If you, if you walk around breathing correctly like that, your nasal pharyngeal space is open and your nose is breathing without resistance, that air is going quickly through your nose. And your mucosal layer has um, villi, uh, flagella on it that are rhythmically binding if, you're, if they're healthy. Tight junctions are tight and that mucus is flowing forward towards the front of your nose, um, along with you know, the whole um, way that viruses are killed um, through the you know, endogenous innate um, system. You kill viruses you know, through the um, myeloperoxidase system. We're making locally small amounts of bleach, kill those cells, hydrogen peroxide, and, um, and then also flushing them out the front of your nose. Um, uh, it's just amazing that, that that ends up being, you know, the hallmarks of what a healthy person is, is also the person that is much less likely to, to get infected with any virus, not just this, this one that is particularly uh, on the forefront of our lines right now. So, so I think yeah. that, you know, I, I probably did a poor job again of, at the beginning of this of, of describing the innate immune system in, in, in an abbreviated view. Again, I, I put a longer version of this um, on in content on my website and on Instagram. And Dr. Cummings, who will be on in a moment, uh, wrote a great blog that kind of summarizes the aspects. There's a whole landing page now on the Zach Bush MD website that will take you through what are the, the, the multiple layers of the innate immune system? But Dr. Gilday here is really describing a very distinct uh, front line of defense, which is the barrier system. So the barriers at our na nasal mucosa, at the actual liquid on the surface of that nasal mucosa, being really the, the beginning of your, uh, your relationship to the virome. And uh, your relationship to the virome is continuous. In my bloodstream right now, it's estimated that I have 10 to the 15 viruses in my bloodstream at the moment as a healthy individual. And so the barrier at my nose is just one of the many barriers between me and the cells within my body that are keeping a relationship to those 10 to the 15 viruses that I'm uh, interacting with or in fellowship with. So uh, it's a really cool uh, description there of the nose. And you know, I'm always struck by how we set, tend to do everything backwards and, and uh, you know, almost in, in an insane fashion in Western medicine, but I, it reminds me of my very first rotation in surgery, which is what I thought I wanted to do with my life uh, as a physician, uh, I wanted to be an ENT surgeon, I thought. And so my first day, we spent the whole day, 12 hours of surgery, three different surgeries, chiseling out the turbinates in the noses of these adult patients. And so therefore removing their entire innate immune system's ability to uh, tur create tur turbid flow within the airflow of their nose. And we did this because they had lots of inflammation and polyps and their immune system was dysfunctioning, so they couldn't breathe. So in response to, oh, your immune system's overwhelmed and you've lost the barriers things, we're just gonna knock out all your turbinates now. And oh, now you can breathe. Now that person's risk of death from respiratory causes goes up over time and everything else. And so I, I, it's just a, an awesome demonstration of the simplicity and beauty, as you say there, John, of, of this human design is such an exquisite thing. Take us from uh, detecting, uh, oh, actually I think there were some other problems that you found and the military found with the effort at, at, at viral uh, warfare. Can you give us a little bit of detail what happened with that? Yes, effort? sure. So um, because it was, um, you know, germ, germ warfare um, testing, there are um, test sites where they uh, aerosolize not the, not the actual um, germ warfare agents, but the model system. And they had um, viruses and bacteria and um, um, proteins, as well as uh, spore forming uh, bacteria. And so when you aerosolize them and, and then you test these devices that we built uh, to detect those, those airborne devices, um, I mean, uh, capturing system and testing systems, 
um, one of the interesting things was none of the, the viral um, vectors ever worked out because they wouldn't survive out in the open in the air um, to make it down to the, to the, the, uh, the uh, detector. Um, so really we knew those, those systems were not gonna be uh, viable um, uh, germorpher agents. So it's also pretty applicable to, to us here now is uh, your safest place to be uh, is uh, outside and uh, those particles just don't live out, outside for very long. Kind of a, a good application of, of uh, just general understanding of making aerosolized virus particles. Uh, yeah, what's being described there is, you know, this awesome, you know, exp expansion of our understanding of the microbiome extends here again, and that the understanding of the innate immune system, our boundary levels of our nasal mucosa, our respiratory mucosa, the layers of our vascular system, our gut membranes, all of these barriers as a front portion, in some ways is a second form of barrier. The first relationship to the biome at large is the sun, the water, the air, the soil. These natural systems are so good at bringing us into balance. And in the recent pandemic, we can pinpoint with great predictive value. We don't even have to wait for, the, for some sort of viral pandemic to express itself. We can predict very, very well uh, that the highest levels of herbicides and pesticides combined with PM 2.5 carbon in the atmosphere, which is a form of, of air pollution from our energy sector and transportation industries, that PM 2.5 binds viruses and creates clumping and artificial survival and you know, an artificial uh, uh, overload of, of viral components in very small spaces. And so PM 2.5 combined with a, lot, a lack of sun, a lack of clean water, a lack of soil, microbial diversity and the rest can predispose a whole population in Northern Italy or parts of the UK, parts of Germany, uh, certainly in the United States, all the hot spots we saw are correlating with these changes in the environment. And so uh, it's exciting for us to expand our concept of innate immune system beyond the word human. When we talk about innate immunity, we're talking about a planetary event. We're talking about an ecosystem event uh, in which we stay in balance with ecosystems and therefore we have human life. It's not surprising that over billions of years of age of our, our, our planet, uh, we show up 200,000 years ago or whatever it is, and, and, and we are, have to be a result of this, this global intelligence rather than against it. So I'm fascinated by your, your experience there in the Army with the limitations of being able to alter that, that germ environment. It doesn't work. It, it, you can't overcome the sun. You can't overcome healthy water and soil and air. And I love that concept that no matter how malicious we get, if we were to recombine, reimagine our lifestyles within nature, we would be that resilient. And that's phenomenal. John, how did you get from Army to University of Virginia and beyond? So my next jump was um, I went to get my PhD. And so I went to Johns Hopkins and did uh, research genetics uh, and fruit flies and uh, did genetic screens. Uh, an interesting part of the genetic screens was one of the screens I did was with uh, mobilizing uh, retrotransposons. So the, there are uh, um, viruses in most cells. And in, in this particular case, for Drosophila, you can make them jump. They're called uh, jumping genes or uh, transposons. So uh, I jumped them around and jumped them into genes to knock things out. And uh, uh, part of that, uh, my experience there was uh, getting, getting an understanding on what uh, this strange process uh, uh, of development that happens is, uh, um, I call it transcriptional memory, but it's, it's how your genome uh, remembers things that happen during development. So, you know, during development, there's these induction events that happen. That, that cell has to remember that induction event for the rest of the rest of that cell's lifetime. And so um, the way that works is there's a, uh, a uh, basically a three-dimensional chromatin architecture that's, that's remembered for every cell division um, that happens after uh, development. And uh, the pertinent part of that is that, you know, these groups of genes, these, uh, uh, some of them are methylation um, genes, uh, 
some of the machinery that carry around the, the these protein complexes that turn on and off genes. But really the relevant part about it is that if um, a cell type during development uh, has a mutation in one of these genes, it basically forgets who it is. And um, whenever a cell forgets who it is, uh, usually has a secondary fate that's just behind it, um, waiting to express. And um, uh, a really good way to understand a lot of the things that we experience in life now that is uh, age related and um, chronic disease related is that um, these stressor events that um, they occupy the machinery that keeps those what I call epigen epigenetic marks, um, the transcriptional memory intact. And so over time and through stress, you forget that each of your cells forgets who it is. And because during development, you know, the body was designed to function in a certain way. Um, and the sort of theme that we keep talking about here is barriers. You know, um, epithelial cells make a barrier. And that barrier doesn't work very well if uh, it's compromised. So as, you, as your cells forget who they are, the gradients that form across uh, a barrier makes that cell and that tissue function less correctly, less, less well. And, um, you know, it's just part of that whole innate immune system where the outside is supposed to stay outside and the inside is supposed to stay inside. Uh, and yet we have to eat. So we have to, we have to take that outside and make it our inside. Um, so digestion and absorption is intimately linked with, with, um, uh, getting rid of toxins. So it ties back to Cindy's, Cindy's uh, comments earlier that, you know, how do you keep a, a toxin outside of your body? And if that toxin is, is disrupting barriers, um, you're much less likely to be able to, to uh, get rid of it. You now the digestion is you break food down into these component parts so that in your intestines, um, those uh, macronutrients and micronutrients are absorbed through specific pathways. And then, and then in the circulation, um, those nutrients are used by cells, but then the kidney comes in into function there. So it does a double filter. It's filtered in your kidney, and then all of those nutrients have to be reabsorbed again. So that double filter that we have is you avoid taking up things that aren't um, part of our recognition system. So they go through our body untouched and stay outside. And then once um, byproducts of metabolism and other toxins that do get in, uh, the double filter is that they go through the kidney and then you have a second time where you reabsorb everything. And then if it's not absorbed there, it goes out into your urine. So it's kind of how you keep your inside clean. And both of those barriers are really um, really important for, for um, keeping your outside outside and your inside inside. And, you know, one of the ways that, you know, I talk to my kids about, you know, that barrier function is that, is that um, I don't think we're saying uh, to our kids uh, as much as we need to is that, you know, that outside world, you want to go into that outside world that's balanced and in harmony. Um, you know, maybe a forest, an untouched forest, go out and get into that forest. And then the foods sh that you're eating should be part of a balanced system also. And in those balanced systems, when you take it into your system, those systems of getting rid of exogenous things has a lot less tax of a job. And so that, uh, that system, that innate community, young kids, and innate immunity are really good. It's very intact. It hasn't forgot who they are yet. And it's really a big problem with, with the system that we have right now. You know, a person that's in their 60s or 70s spent so much time outside of nature, outside of being in balance, eating things that come from sterilized fields, um, that over time you have made every one of those cells that is supposed to remember who it is from development and work so well when you're young is forgotten.
forgotten who they are and um, are not functioning as well. And so these new bad guys, if it is a bad guy, can infiltrate your, your system and do a lot of harm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of questions coming through that we'll get addressed later, but really about the layers of the innate immune system and the rest. And so um, I'll, I'll go into some detail at the end of this, but what Dr. Gilday is describing as these, these compartments, uh, these boundary events, tight junctions, the Velcro between them, you've heard, if you've heard any of my lectures, you've heard that at nauseum. Dr. Gilday was really the one to introduce me to the tight junction world and, and to their complexity. He has uh, been one of the, the uh, great scientists in our cadre that have worked very hard to understand the role of those, those tight junctions in uh, the human resiliency, the innate immune system, as well as the role of the microbiome and their communication network in maintaining those tight junction systems with all of the product, uh, product science that we've created over the years. And so uh, the boundary is one event. And then this genomic memory of what is self is this deeper level, uh, or this genetic level, which actually is one of the most regulated uh, environments of the innate immune system. So the decision to take an RNA strand and turn it into a protein within the cytoplasm of the cell is now considered one of the most heavily regulated decisions that the cell will ever make. And so this model of a virus taking over every cell that it touches is an you know, almost 100 year old belief system that just has not played out that way. Uh, we know that cells have a moment-to-moment -moment decision making as to which proteins they produce, and uh, and, and the same thing is going to happen when you take an mRNA vaccine, for example. And so the messenger RNA in that vaccine, the cell is going to have to decide to make a protein out of that. It can't force your cells to make that, and so that's why our regulatory groups and, and CDC, NIH, and the drug companies have been so clear. We don't know if, if a, an mRNA thing is going to do anything to your immune system because we don't know if you're going to make enough protein to do, induce an antibody. So this is you know one of the issues that we have around genomics is we can't actually trick the system that easily. The system has so many checks and balances and so many regulatory steps to decide whether a virus uh, has downstream capacity to change protein synthesis in our body or not. And so, uh, John, you're, you're touching on this incredible world of genomic uh, variability or genomic control. Can you give us a, just a snapshot of what is an exosome? Uh, you're one of the, the world experts in, in isolating exosomes. And, and so give us a, a glimpse of uh, our current understanding of, of exosome communication. Yes, yeah, so I would describe those um, um, as the um, the, the genome is very plastic. It's able to it's able to change within um, you know designed normal uh, normal ranges. And uh, one of the things that's been sort of a mystery for a long time is how one cell um, talks to another cell um, adjacent to it or even at larger distances away. And one of the things that's evolved um, from um, trying to figure out that system is that there's kind of an endogenous virus system that's going on inside your body. Um, you make little tiny um, nucleic acid um, carrying vesicles at all times. Um, they're called exosomes and they have um, receptors on their surface and they're carrying cargo. Um, what I have studied the most so far is um, microRNAs that are being carried by these exosomes and these little cargo um, cargo uh, filled membrane vesicles that look a lot like viruses go between cells and those uh, the components of the exosomes are dumped into another cell and release the microRNA into the adjacent cell and is able to change um, transcription, change gene expression in the recipient cell. So the state um, of one cell can be communicated to adjacent or downstream cells uh, by packaging genetic material into an exosome and then transferring it to um, uh, along with the targeting um, surface proteins to to change the genome of, of adjacent cells so that's kind of a uh, uh, fall in line with you know a lot a lot of the things I've heard you talk about is you know the endogenous uh, viral systems and uh, some of these viruses hijacking components of that and uh, uh, 
one little interesting component of that, just because I, I, I've been using viruses for a long time in my career to accomplish tax, tasks. Um, you can do the same thing with exosomes. You can pack them full of genetic material of your choosing and then transfect cells to change their behavior. Um, same with viruses. And um, the interesting part about uh, viruses that's sometimes uh, not a good thing that happens from it is they pick up genetic material from the host and they get integrated into the virus itself. That is a whole you know, area of study of uh, viral oncogenes to pick up a, a function and ascribe it then to the virus that makes it uh, makes it more um, makes it worse for the host. And one of the things that was picked up on this latest uh, coronavirus is a you know furin cleavage site that is a is an endogenous site that comes from um, what a lot of people think is the uh, ENAC gene, the sodium regulatory um, gene that's found in the kidney. And and that new site has to be cleaved in over order for it to be infected. And uh, that's paired off all of the old old viruses. So um, that concept of viruses sometimes picking up things from the host and, and sometimes doing using it for bad is, is you know, this virus is no different than a lot of the other viruses that have been shown to be bad players. Amazing. Very good. I want to turn our attention to some clinical intervention here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilday. Uh, appreciate you guys staying online, Cindy and John, as we move towards a discussion uh, element of our presentation. But I want to turn to Dr. Cowden. Uh, Dr. Cowden, you work with over 4,000 doctors around the world uh, in the integrated medicine world and have uh, a huge insight into uh, the, the methodologies that are being used globally to support the innate immune system. And so we're looking forward to having uh, your perspective on uh, how did you get from cardiologist to integrative medicine and uh, to this discussion today? And then what are you seeing working on the global community to really support and change the way in which our innate immune system interacts with our environment? Yeah, uh, fortunately, I, uh, I learned about alternative medicine and integrative medicine in my first couple of months of medical school. Uh, I had lived in arid West Texas all my life, and I moved to humid Houston for medical school, and I uh, very soon developed allergic rhinitis, then allergic sinusitis, then infective sinusitis, then bronchitis, and finally pneumonia. And I became so ill, I couldn't go to class. And uh, I went to the chairman of three different medical school departments and followed their instructions for taking the pharmaceuticals, and I got progressively worse. And thank goodness, my wife's grandmother came to visit us. And uh, she took pity on me. She took me by the hand to the health food store and got me on some vitamins, minerals, and herbs, and I got well in about a month. And I thought, oh my goodness, I need to learn what this woman knows, and I need to take with a grain of salt everything I learned in the medical training institution after this. So that was my introduction. Whenever I had time to uh, learn something, I didn't uh, study you know, medical journal articles or even medical books. I would go dig out uh, you know, books on nutrition or on herbs or on other natural things and uh, study those. And uh, so by the time I finished my formal training nine years later, I, uh, I had uh, a pretty good knowledge of integrative medicine and uh, started you know, using that for my patients and started teaching that to uh, other practitioners. Extraordinary to me. Uh, what, what is your what is your favorite part about being uh, around the community of, of this international integrative medicine group at this point? What, 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 do you, what do you see as the trend perhaps there uh, globally and, and what gives you hope for the future? Well, I think uh, our, our world is in a mess right now in, in many different ways. Uh, we're, you know, one of the things we're, we're toxic overloaded from you know, the pesticides and the herbicides and the antibiotics and uh, all the other contaminants in the in the environment, but also we're overloaded with uh, electromagnetic pollution, and I, I think that concerns me as much as the uh, chemical pollution. Uh, you know, the the five G that's being rolled out worldwide uh, is the is a sixty gigahertz signal, which was used by the U.S. military as a weapon prior to somebody deciding to use it as a communication device. 
and uh, that concerns me. Uh, I, I was in practice until, uh, until November of, of 2019, uh, seeing patients out in Phoenix, Arizona, and I became so ill in the eight days that I stayed out there that I could barely make it through the last couple of days. I developed atrial fibrillation and chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and uh, headaches and uh, brain fog and shortness of breath and so on. And uh, I figured out that it was because I was sleeping all night long, a very short distance away from a, uh, a 5G tower. There you go, 5G tower. And, uh, and uh, working all day long, only a, a, a few yards from a, a 5G tower. So uh, I got zapped pretty hard. And when I, um, when I uh, went back out to West Texas to try to get some uh, reprieve from that 5G experience, I didn't get well quickly. And I thought, what the heck is going on here? And my, uh, my son gave me a clue. He, uh, he told me that his wife and he had a good sleep until uh, a few months before that, but then they both had developed bad sleep at the same time. And he had to have a new roof put on his house because he had a hailstorm. And when he put the new roof on the house, instead of putting an asphalt shingle roof, they put a metal roof on the house. And after they put the metal roof on the house, they both started, so both started sleeping well again. And as soon as he told me that, I realized that we were being zapped from above. So I got on the internet and figured out that the US government had approved 40,000 satellites to be put into orbit above the world to broadcast 5G down upon us. And at that point, there was already several hundred that had been deployed. So I had become sensitized to the 5G signal out in Phoenix and I was still being zapped by it in my pristine house in West Texas. So that, that put me on a new path of uh, learning about uh, electromagnetic pollution and what, what can be done about that. What's the best approach do you think at this point that you're seeing coming out of the integrated medicine community to find ways to make us resilient in these toxic environments from chemicals to EMFs and the rest. Uh, what, are, what are your favorite tools at this point? Well, I think it has to go back to the basics. The, the first and foremost is always uh, drink enough water and clean up the diet. And uh, you know, now it's really, really hard to find clean food in a grocery store. So if your best bet is to put it in your own garden in your backyard and put it inside of a greenhouse, preferably, so the glyphosate that's in the rain doesn't get rained on it. <laughs> uh, but then, uh, if you can't, if you don't have a backyard, if you don't have the ability to put in a garden, then uh, do what I call the four-foot farm, which is basically putting a, 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 some vegetables into buckets in front of your uh, windows that are south-facing, so you're growing vegetables inside your house. Uh, you know, raising your own, own produce and not having to rely on the, the contaminated um, produce that was uh, sold at the grocery store, harvested weeks before it became ripe. And then, you know, after, after you do that, then you, know, you, you try to uh, clean up the electromagnetic environment as best you can. You know, you turn off your Wi-Fi all the time, preferably, but at least at bedtime every night and uh, unplug the, uh, you know, the a cordless phone, get rid of that completely from the house, get a corded phone instead. Uh, make sure your cell phone is, is at least uh, 20 or 30 feet away from your bed, perfectly in airplane mode while it's charging. And uh, you know, turn off the breakers that go to your bedroom at night, you know, clean up the EMF that way. If you live in an apartment, try to make plans to move out of an apartment to a, a single family dwelling uh, so that your neighbors are not just right on the other side of the wall uh, zapping you with their Wi-Fi and electric smart meter and cordless phones and all that stuff. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's about, uh, you know, detoxifying, you know, trying to get rid of the toxins that are going in, whether it's electromagnetic toxins or chemical toxins, and trying to put in more good stuff, you know, the, the, the foods that have, you know, really good nutrient value, uh, ha you know, have plenty of, uh, you know, vitamins and minerals. Between uh, 1935 and 1965, the U.S. Department of Agriculture tells us that there was a 70% loss of vitamin and mineral content in the, the foods that were grown on regular uh, soil in the United States. And, uh, you know, we, I, my estimate is that we lost more than an additional 70% of that 
since 1965. And so we're down to very little. And the reason is because it's uh, of the corporate farming. They're growing the same crops on the same ground year after year, never rotating the, the crops, never uh, you know, replenishing the soil. Or you know, they put a little phosphate back in, maybe a little potassium. They call that uh, sufficient uh, re remediation of the soil. You know, we're, we're dying because we, we don't have nutrients of sufficient amounts to regenerate our body. And, uh, and to detoxify our body. You know, we have to have enough of the, of the vitamins and minerals to act as cofactors and coenzymes for the, for the enzymes that help to detoxify us and, uh, and restore our, our health. You know, it's yeah, we've got a mess. No, it's, a, it's an extraordinary world we live in and an extraordinary resilience in, underneath the surface there. Uh, Dr. Gilday, when you touched on the hydrogen peroxide and all of that, uh, you were talking about endogenous systems that are able to make hydrogen peroxide, cells that are be able to, to cleanse and treat this thing. So in the integrative medicine, we've gotten into things like vitamin C infusions, which is simply a, a mechanism for delivering hydrogen peroxide where we're deficient in hydrogen peroxide. Delivering uh, hydrogen has been a big therapy and, and Asia uh, has pioneered this. Japan is infusing uh, hydrogen H2 into the yeah. bloodstream of people presenting with acute heart attack or, or cancer, whatever it is, with incredible results. And it turns out the microbiome in your gut, when healthy, produces an enormous amount of H2. Exactly. And it's not a storage of hydrogen. And so it's, it's always so exciting to me in this world of integrative medicine that anytime we find a tool that's starting to tell us that, hey, we're onto something, we find out within a few years, that's what your body was making before you screwed with it, before you destroyed its toxicity, before you took away the nutrient delivery systems yeah. of food, all of this. And so it's it's just extraordinary, just as the, the exquisite design of the nose that you discussed, Dr. Gilday, this, this, this exquisite design of detox is so powerful. And to see somebody like you, Cindy, turn around so fast with just a change in your nutrition and some support to your microbiome. Uh, that you did with ion and all of that it was this transformation in your health that that changed your immune system fundamentally uh, from your yep. thyroid function all the way down to your your skin uh, microbiome and your skin uh, innate immune system with the elimination of the eczema and everything else the microbiome is is so good at doing what it does and that's that's where yep. i've staked my hope in the future is mother yep. nature is smarter than the, the insanity of humanity absolutely and so, and you know it's, uh, al al almost everything that we put in our mouth from the regular grocery store has something in it that's going to kill off some of the friendly bacteria in the gut that are supposed to be producing and pr producing uh, uh, vitamins, producing uh, you know uh, high, you know molecular hydrogen as you point out, uh, producing other things that our body absolutely needs, and we're we're just killing the the, the you know the microbiome uh, every day that we eat the regular food from the restaurants or the grocery store. So we need to get back to nature. Uh, years ago, I had a, a, a elderly woman who said that she had a son uh, that was chronically ill and she took him to every doctor specialist that she could imagine and he can't continue to get worse and worse. Then she finally took him to an old country doctor and the country doctor said, uh, well, tell me a little bit about, you know, you know, his life, you know, tell me, you know, what he does. Does he play out in the backyard? Oh no, he's too sick to play out in the backyard. Uh, so, so the doctor said, okay, if you want to get him well, you need to go out in the backyard and use the hose and squirt, squirt the hose on the ground and put, put the little boy, he's about three or four years old, in that puddle of mud and let him play in that. Eat it, eat it if he wants to, okay? Play mud pies. And uh, pretty soon, he's completely well. That's the only therapy, just eating dirt, eating mud, okay? <laughs> I love that. That is a beautiful therapeutic intervention. I think that that's what we could all use after a year of quarantine and Netflix. We need to yeah. all sit in a, in a mud puddle somewhere. I love that. Uh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, we got, we got, I don't know how we got off exactly into the, into the, into the uh, Pasteur theory. Uh, I guess he was a big flamboyant guy back in the 1800s, but, uh, but his contemporary, Louis, uh, was uh, Antoine Béchamp. And Béchamp said, it, the terrain is everything, absolutely everything, you know, and he was saying, you know, the terrain inside the body, the gut terrain, the skin microbiome, the, the, the health of the cells, and so on. If you have healthy cells and healthy myome, you're not going to get infections. And uh, actually, he, uh, Pasteur challenged him to a debate, and, it, and he came to the debate, and Pasteur said, okay, if you believe what you say, 
then drink this vial of cholera. And Bashamp says, I accept your challenge. And so Bashamp turned around and handed the, the, the vial of cholera to his assistant, said, drink it. And his, <laughs> his, his assistant drank it and did not become ill because they had already been working on his terrain for a long period of time and he did not become ill. And uh, you know, on, on Pasteur's deathbed, Pasteur said, the terrain is everything. So he finally acknowledged that Deschamps was right. But unfortunately, by that time, he, what was in the literature was all of Pasteur's lives. So we ended up going down that path. It sells a lot more drugs, but it's not necessarily best for the body. Well, as we start to think about, thank you, Dr. Cowden, for that overview. I mean, we'll come back to Q&A with you and uh, more discussion. But as we're thinking about uh, the gut and what we're putting into it, uh, I'm excited to have Dr. Cummings join us here. Uh, Peter, would you give us uh, a connection to the gut-brain axis as a neuropathologist? Uh, there's a lot of attention over the last two decades on the gut-brain connections and all of that. How does that relate to the innate immune system? Right. Well, I think, you know, uh, like for that one, I, just, I, I used to hate when you put me in the fir first. Now I'm not so sure I like going last because I got to follow all these people. The same director Cowan was, was great. I mean, it gives me some, some validity when I go to my son and he gets hurt. I say, just rub some dirt in it. You know, just you'll be all right. You'll heal. Um, yeah, but I think we're going to circle back to a lot of the things that we've talked about with sleep, nutrition particularly, um, when we start talking about the role that the nervous system plays with our gut and particularly the microbiome. But I think if we take a step back and think about how it relates to the innate immune system as a whole, um, I, I was thinking this morning, I was walking my, my dog um, through the woods and having some quiet time and that we think of the immune system as a barrier between us and nature, us and our environment. And it really isn't. It's more really a sophisticated filtering system that allows us to not separate ourselves from our environment, but integrate with it. And the central part of that um, process as we pass through our environment is our central nervous system and how that controls things. And to touch on what Cindy was saying, she said something that, that struck me this morning when I was on my walk, that everything matters. And when we talk about nutrition, we're not talking about just food you eat. When we talk about filtering or barriers to our environment nature, we're not just talking about microbiomes and viruses and fungi or whatever else, we're, we're talking about light, you know? Um, we light, uh, we're a very important species, we're, we're beings of light. Our mitochondria depend on it. We have certain cells that, that use light energy to, especially in the electron transport chain, to breathe. Um, sounds, uh, certain sounds can affect our emotional state. Um, air, what we breathe, um, the food that we eat, the water we drink, everything we encounter in our environment um, is filtered through our central nervous system and affects us in one way or another. And I'd like to, to talk about the idea of the cranial nerves, which why do we have 12 nerves that innervate our face. It seems like kind of overkill. We've got this much body space. It's not very much, but yet it, it manifests it, 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 it manifests so much neurological input. And a lot of it comes back to our brainstem, uh, where these nerves originate from and where they, they come and go and speak to are our brainstem, where we have our heart rate um, receptors, we have our uh, breathing receptors, all of these things happen in our brainstem. And so our, our, as we evolved from four-legged creatures, when you know, we would enter the environment as a dog would, um, the cranial nerves are really very important in how we mitigated threats or relationships in our environment. So the cranial nerves became very, very, very involved in, in our ex exploration of nature. Um, light from optic nerves, sounds, all of these things are tapped into emotional centers in our brain as well. They're very closely re regulated with, or integrated with something called the limbic system, uh, which is how we uh, uh, foster emotions, whether they're what I call the four Fs of life, uh, fight, flight, feeding, and fornication, so you can survive as a species, uh, all come from cranial nerves. So the one very important cranial nerve is our vagus nerve. And it doesn't get a huge amount of attention in medical school or when we learn about it. The vagus nerve means the wanderer. And it goes from your brainstem all the way down into your gut. And 
we learn about it in medical school as being, uh, you know, it's the vagus nerve, acetylcholine, and um, it innervates the parasympathetic nervous system, next topic. But what it does is so much more than that. And we want to get down and think about the heart, the lungs, and even the, the cells of the gastrointestinal system. Um, it is that tone or the, the firing or activity of that vagus nerve is really important for our emotional state. And our emotional states will affect the firing downstream of that vagus nerve why our heart rate goes up. If we have a decreased or less firing of the vagus nerve, our heart rate's gonna increase. Um, the vagus nerve also is responsible for secreting a lot of inflammatory markers uh, or chemicals that enhance inflammation in the body. Um, and so when you have problems with the vagus nerve, whether it's from stress or toxins or light, sound pollutions, all these different things we're talking about, um, we can have imbalances in the way that we respond um, in our immune system. And the immune system isn't a fighter. I mean, we talk about this a little bit in the blog. We think about the immune system as being these fighters that are protecting us from everything, but they're a really important part of regeneration and healing in our bodies. And it's when that process gets skewed um, or exaggerated um, is when we start developing chronic inflammatory diseases. So it's really that vagus nerve that gets down there into the cells of the gastrointestinal system that secrete these various cytokines that support the cells. Um, some of those compounds also support the microbiome. One of the biggest, uh, some of the biggest neurotransmitters in city uh, serotonin. Um, one of the very important regulators sleep and mood. Uh, most of that's produced by our gut microbiome. Um, so we need that relationship between the vagus nerve, the brain, uh, and what's happening in our gut. And everything along that axis is dependent upon how we interact with our environment. Right now, we're, we're all scared, we're locked up, um, we're the levels of stress, and now I'm seeing this in our youth athletes that don't have sports right now, and the stress, anxiety, substance abuse, all of these things are skyrocketing. Domestic abuse, child abuse, um, all the stresses that are put on us um, aren't doing our immune system any favors, uh, because when we're stressed out, we're more susceptible to all kinds of different things, not just this particular virus that's affecting our society right now, but all the other comorbidities that, that come along with stress. And anyone who's seen this uh, talk before, we know that, um, you know, I always felt as a forensic pathologist doing thousands of autopsies and seeing young people in their 30s and 40s dying of heart attacks. I mean, what we're experiencing in our environment is literally killing us. And, and you know, ways to deal with that, particularly with helping our innate immune systems, a lot of things we've all been talking about, particularly in the brain, um, stress uh, and anxiety mitigation. There's so much interesting information coming out around uh, the relationship of that vagal nerve tone and the, as you shift into that fight or flight state and its impact on the microbiome. And so a recognition that within hours of stress, you start to shift your microbiome, you start to lose biodiversity there. And it's an intriguing concept to me at the kind of the metaphysical level of like, do bacteria and fungi sense, in fact, uh, the stress that you're having and withdraw, you know? And so, because uh, when you start to become stressed and you go through the endocrine and the neuroendocrine events of stress, you start to exude the, the microRNA that Dr. Gilday was talking about earlier. And so you're exuding these stress signals so that the genomics around you both within your body and different organ systems and outside of your body start to have a stress adaptation. And I've seen this again and again in clinic over the last 10 years as I've gotten more and more kind of tuned into the extra patient environment. Like, okay, here's my patient, here's what they say their stressors are, but what's the environment around them? What are those stressors? And we start to realize that when we see something like a viral syndrome go tearing through a family, we think, oh my gosh, what an infectious virus or what an infectious you know, process is going on when in fact, the stress within that organism of a family can predict the pattern of, of disorder or dis-ease happening in, within that family unit. And so what's really familial or what is really, really infectious in that case is actually the individual stress level rather than the germs themselves. So we're, we're getting to this really extraordinary understanding that stress literally changes our genetics and the genetics then change our adaptive behavior. And at the same time, the microbiome responsible for at least 90% of the enzymatic work done in our body, meaning detox, metabolism, digestion, 
uh, clearance, all of those systems also start shutting down because the microbiome is withdrawing from that, that scenario. Can you give us just a quick synopsis of, of the immune system in the brain and peripheral nervous system and how it relates to the innate immunity? Yeah, and to touch on what you're, you're saying, and I think that's exactly right, because when we have a, immune responses to things, um, there's really kind of two stereotypical things that'll happen in the human body. We either see it and send the smoke signals that um, we have something we need to deal with here, and those would be the cytokines and pro-inflammatory chemicals uh, like interleukin-1 or um, you know, these different cytokines that we have. The other way is we attack them and then if I eat them up, gobble them up. And I think that, you know, there may be, because the first response is the signaling. So when you do have some stress being delivered to the body, whether, and you're not just, you know, it, nothing happens in isolation. When we're stressed out, we're not just stressing out our microbiome in our like, gastrointestinal system. We're also stressing out the microbiome that exists in our other organ systems. I mean, we have other microorganisms that live throughout our body that are just as important to our well-being. So I think that when you, when you are stressed, you are altering the chemicals that are neurotransmitters that are coming from the vagus nerve into the various ganglia or wherever they're going into whatever organ system, telling the, the, the cells of that tissue and the microorganisms that live along it that, hey, something isn't right here. And, uh, and definitely altering physiology and our biology that way. Within the brain, the brain is, is um, you know, ha has a very interesting sort of immune system. And, and we're, we're learning a lot about how the brain responds to various things in, in, in terms of uh, in inflammation um, in itself. Uh, the first kind of thing you think about is the uh, aspect, and that's the blood brain barrier. So when blood vessels leave your heart and they go up into your brain, um, usually what happens in a tissue, things can move in and out of that blood vessel into the tissue pretty easily. Sometimes you need proteins to transport them to open the door. Um, but in the brain, the blood vessels are surrounded by the little feet of these cells called astrocytes. And they will surround the blood vessel and create a barrier around it so things can't get out um, of the blood vessels into the brain very easily. Um, so the blood brain barrier is one of them. And we talked about astrocytes before when we discussed nutrition. Um, and astrocytes being the glycogen storage, um, looks like the glucose storage uh, cell of the brain. So when neurons need glucose to function and do the things they do, that glucose comes from our astrocytes. So the astrocytes are really the nurse cell. It's taking care of the neurons, getting rid of metabolic waste, helping it use nutrients that it needs to be able to function properly. And you're finding that in a lot of chronic diseases of the brain, whether they're neurodegenerative diseases in particular, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, that's alterations of the astrocytes um, that, that are really causing a lot of the problems and the neuroinflammation that's happening as a result of that um, is causing a lot of the diseases, the chronic diseases within the brain. The, the other thing that we have inside the brain is something called a microglial cell. And the microglial cell is essentially um, the, the my, macrophage of the brain. It's the responder um, to insult and injuries within the brain. But like I said, with everything with inflammation, there's a physiological benefit to it as well. And the microglial cells very early, early on in our development are responsible for pruning neurons. So when we're growing and developing as babies um, into teenagers, um, our neurons are forming connections with places. And some of those connections we don't need anymore or are not useful and taking up space. So it's kind of like cleaning house. So the microglial cell comes in, oh, we don't need this axon, and it eats it up and it goes away. Oh, we don't need this one, we'll you know, take care of that one too. So it prunes and helps, helps with neuroplasticity and the development of, of the brain as you age. Um, and also when you have uh, viral infections um, um, within the brain or other situations like that, the microglial cells are kind of our first responders and they'll uh, call the form these little things called microglial nodules. Um, so when you look at a brain under a microscope for someone who's, on, who's had a biopsy or unfortunately passed away, in some viral infections, we'll see collections of clumps of many, many microglial cells around the brain to tell us that there's been a, a virus here. So microglial cells are really important for plasticity, dealing with injury, um, and infection, uh, as are our astrocytes. The one thing that's interesting about the brain is when we were at UVA, Zach, uh, some of the, the neurology and neurosurgeon people um, were, were really great about 
coming down and seeing their autopsies from their patients who unfortunately passed away. Like it's an incredible learning opportunity for physicians. And uh, they were probably one of the most active groups I've been around who wanted to know what happened. They wanted to know what this disease did. And everybody was always on the lookout for the metastatic glioblastoma. They, the brain, primary brain tumors do not metastasize outside of the brain. And part of the theory for that in the old days was that the brain doesn't have a lymphatic system. And so when we have metastatic tumors coming from the breast or the lung, more often than not, they spread through our lymphatic system, which is why they check for lymph nodes, those sort of things. So um, you're finding out now that there actually is quite an intricate uh, lymphatic system within the brain um, that is responsible. And that's sort of a, uh, a new idea and philosophy and science is coming out around that. Um, that's very exciting to see, see how that works. So we, like I always joke, that I love doing neuroscience in the brain because the best and most common answer is, I don't know. You know, nobody really knows all these things about the brain and it's a great field to get into because it's constant discovery of, of new information. Beautiful. Thank you all. I want to spend a few minutes of just reaction time for all of you before we turn over to Q&A. Um, but uh, any burning thoughts, questions, uh, clarifications, or things that get jogged in your uh, mindset when you were hearing the other panelists? I'll go first on that one. C Cindy was, uh, said something I thought was so important. I think it was Cindy, or may, it may have, may have, I think it was Cindy. Um, and I think you touched on it too, Zach. This culture that we're kind of living in right now, um, where there's two sort of camps of people, um, either you believe science or you're a science denier, either you believe my facts or you're a denier. That's not how science works. Um, you know, so, like I said previously, I've always said this, even to medical students and graduate students, you don't believe in science. There's nothing to believe in. When you believe, you become biased. When you enter belief into a system, you, you inherently become biased. It's not a faith, it's not a religion, it's not a philosophy, it's a process. You can have faith and believe in the process, but you can't believe in science. It's not something you can believe in. And, there's, there's, I was always, I was very naive as a baby scientist that everybody wanted to talk and debate, and discuss science. And that's not true. Um, you know, it's a, a very difficult world to navigate um, the truth, which really surprised me as an adult, that science should always be openly debated and discussed. And I think that's the beauty of the scientific process. I think you guys touched on that. I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. I, I think that's one of the most critical things that we should all take away from this is that when dogma becomes uh, the harbinger of, of crisis, I think is really the reality. We, we lose the scientific process when we start to uh, ascribe to dogma. And we've seen a lot of that this year. So appreciate that uh, insight. Other uh, questions and, and uh, thoughts from the group there before we jump into the, the audience? I think one, one thing that strikes me is um, just the complexity that when I hear you talk, the group of you that are experts and you know have all of these different perspectives, just how complex and amazing the human body is. And the regulatory agencies are trying to reduce that to a test. And it just is not possible. You can't, you can't distill that down to here is the immunotoxicity test. You know, you take a, a rat 28 days, you're exposing it, you know, you're then. Uh, putting sheep red blood cells in and seeing reaction as if that's somehow can capture, you know, the impact um, on the immune system. And it's just, it's just not possible. So anyway, every time I listen to people have this kind of discussion, it's just amazing to me that we even try to do that. Um, it's, it's a, it's a daunting task and no wonder we're failing at it. Yeah. Other reactions. All right. Dr. Cowden. If you're going to try to do something to look at the immune system, it needs to be a functional test. You know, so, so often the tests that are developed are uh, not functional tests. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about uh, you know, functional levels of vitamins and minerals in the body. So you want to see how the enzymes uh, use those vitamins and minerals and, and work properly or not. And, uh, you know, a functional test in the uh, immune system evaluation is the 
is the uh, T killer cell function test. Uh, uh, how, how well does the T cell kill a cancer cell? And, uh, and so it's just, uh, we, need, we need to be developing more tests like that if we're gonna try to, to, try to use tests at all, not, not uh, just a test to, 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 to you know, like a, a CT scan gives you an anatomical information, but not functional information. A functional MRI scan gives you functional information and anatomical information, as an example. Excellent point. Dr. Gilday. Yeah, I was going to make a comment about the um, nervous system. I just sparked my memory that uh, one of the projects that we're doing right now is um, blood pressure, salt's effect on blood pressure. And um, we're part of a group that was developing a uh, um, continuous blood pressure meter. And uh, one of the strange things that I found out from that was um, that my blood pressure would go up depending who I was around or go down. And then, you know, the interaction between people and, you know, your physiologies are, are linked between people. And another one was um, I used to do a lot of uh, experiments on rats and one of the things that I found out that I did kind of unconsciously was when I would go into the room to get the, to get the rat to, to do my experiments, I would um, consciously calm myself down and try and, um, you know, center myself because when I would go to get the rat, the rat would know my state. And if I was really agitated, that rat would be agitated as I went to grab him. And, um, I got so good at it that I, I, I didn't realize that I was really even doing it. And the next day after um, I left my postdoc, uh, another um, postdoc took over my position of getting these rats. And the first day, the postdoc had his finger almost chewed off by a bite, broke the bone in his finger because he was so anxious about, about having to go <laughs> grab this rat that uh, it was, you know, very overexcited. So, kind of curious that even even the the interaction that you're talking about within your own brain and your own body, that it even that even goes out to people around you, and uh, that uh, you know that that getting out into into the environment that's placid and beautiful and balanced um, that is also uh, around people. And that uh, you know, surround yourself with people that are accepting of you, and and uh, that can keep you calm. I guess that would be the opposite too. If you want to get wound up, you know, get on a hockey team that's uh, crazy and uh, really works hard. So you, know, you, you get a good exercise too. <laughs> Excellent. All right, I uh, want to turn over to some questions and all of you as speakers, thank you for your time. Thank you for being a part of this. Just so grateful for your respective uh, perspectives on this situation. Um, for all of the questions, there's an enormous number that are focused on, you know, please describe the innate immune system in de more detail. Uh, please go to the blog that was written and attached to the innate immune system uh, uh, event today. It goes into great detail into the different sectors of the innate immune system. Uh, for a deeper dive on the bigger picture of viruses in the innate immune system, please go to the 12-minute video there on the website or the shorter video there on uh, Instagram is also Facebook. Um, so those are places to answer a bunch of these questions. Um, but uh, a lot of the questions, you know, John, you spurred a lot of interest in the nose. And so there's a bunch of questions around how do we uh, create a healthy nasal environment? And is the nose really killing those viruses or what, what's happening when, it, when the nose captures those viruses? Because uh, a number of people are pointing out that viruses aren't alive. They're just genetic information thing. So what do we mean when we say we kill a virus? It's not really a living thing. So it's a bit of a, a lexicon issue here, but how does the body then uh, disarm uh, or for that matter, uh, when you were talking about the environment uh, where you were, the military is trying to do germ warfare with viruses, but the sunshine kept disarming uh, those viruses. Uh, and so can you give us a description of what's happening there when, when the, the virus is disarmed? Yeah, so, um, you know, the virus doesn't enter the cell and reproduce until, you know, it, it fuses with the, uh, the receptor that's on the outside. So in the case of the most recent virus, that's, you know, the ACE, ACE2 receptor. Um, so it has to, there has to be a whole series of events that happen before that virus is put 
into the cell and then reproduce and then lysed and shed or just shed. Um, you know, and that's why the tests are all around in the mouth. Um, the barriers that you're talking about um, uh, in general are your mucosal layer that's on the outside of your cells. So those viruses are caught in very sticky designed mucus secretions. And, um, and then the low level production of um, hypochloride, chloride and hydrogen peroxide, um, as well as uh, keeping them outside of the body, um, outside of a cell. Uh, inside the cell is a reducing environment that uh, doesn't have nearly as much oxidation. So the longer you can keep it outside of your body, um, it's going to oxidize and get inactivated. And so, you know, that barrier that we're talking about there is um, just keeping that virus from getting to the cell surface. And then also um, a lot of the processes for getting uh, the virus into the cell is that you have to, you know, you have to do that tearing cleavage in order to, to clip the, clip the spike protein on the, on the surface of the virus. And then you have to have uh, TMPRSS2 is a protease that's uh, androgen driven in order to clip the ACE2 receptor so that you have binding and membrane fusion and then taking it into the cell. But um, there's, there's still five or more steps uh, before there's, you know, the RNA dependent RNA replication uh, to replicate the virus and then packaging the viruses into virus particles and then joining that um, membrane um, production system that that's the same as the exosome. Uh, there's multiple steps in all of all of those in a in a balanced cell that prevents it from from um, replicating. So you're, you know it's it's like also like with toxins, you know it's all in the dose. You know a small amount of virus particles um, doesn't really come from a person who's not um, badly infected. So those small amount of particles comes in contact with a person who's also healthy, your body can contain those small amounts of particles. But uh, you know, a huge amount of particles introduced to a person is where um, that innate, innate immune system it might be overwhelmed. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Dr. Cowan, there's some uh, questions around the EMF topic of how they directly would affect the innate immune system and our ability to deal with something like coronavirus. What are your insights there? Uh, I think EMF uh, pollution is one of the primary things that knocks our overall immune system down and makes it difficult for our bodies to overcome whatever uh, toxic load we have or whatever infectious load we have. And so I think it's important uh, if you're going to try to prevent, let's say, COVID, that you uh, reduce the EMF in your environment as much as possible. Uh, and so, as I said, turn off the Wi-Fi, turn off, uh, get rid of the cordless phones, uh, uh, turn off the, uh, uh, yeah. the, the cell phone, all that kind of stuff. But, but uh, yeah, you know, data on oxygen uh, carrying capacity and the like, and how it relates to uh, EMF. I say it again. I think you have some data on the oxygen carrying capacity. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the 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 sixty gigahertz has been shown to dis to displace oxygen from hemoglobin, so that that's a, a big problem, and uh, so that's what's being put on the, the little uh, transmitters in every major uh, you know neighborhood across the country right now. Uh, people need to stand up against that and not not let that roll out. Uh, in the nineteen nineties, the uh, the the uh, telephone industry said that. Uh, they needed to increase their rates in order to put in a fiber optic system to, you know, to have high speed internet. Uh, and they, the, the rates went up, but they didn't do any of that to, to build the, uh, the, the fiber optic system. So now they're going back and saying, well, we need the you know, money from the government to pay for the, the 5G satellites and the 5G installation in the, in the communities. Uh, whenever they originally agreed that they were gonna do it by fiber optic, which would not be harmful to health. Yeah, and it's significant in this current you know system that when when our innate immune system drops and, and some of the fundamental things are a lack of, of of sunshine, so vitamin D drops every fall, so we go into this seasonal winter and our vitamin D levels drop. We are, are have less fruits and fresh fruits and vegetables in our diets, therefore we have less 
uh, of the hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen and all the other things that we would expect to get from things like vitamin C and those fruits and vegetables and everything. And then we developed this respiratory syndrome in the fall. And it's uh, what we see with that is this risk of hypoxia. And this coronavirus is classic, both at SARS in 2002, uh, MERS in 2012, and then uh, what we're calling COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, in, in 2019. All of these are inducing hypoxia symptoms more than they are infectious symptoms. And so 5,700 patients submitted to New York hospitals with uh, uh, coronavirus type syndromes, we see them with normal white blood cell counts, no fever, but they are hypoxic and they have early organ failure. And uh, what this is in indicative of, or, or the best scientific description of this is something called histotoxic hypoxia, where the red blood cell has lost the ability to carry, carry this. And there's ways in which uh, viruses can induce an inflammatory cascade that we actually, our own immune system can get involved. And this is where something like arthritis is a good example of an immune system run awry where it'll destroy a whole joint in its effort to continue this inflammatory cascade. A similar fashion there. And then you can start to see the overlapping toxicity. And so you now put 5G radiation, which at the 60 Hertz level disrupts oxygen from the hemoglobin in context of this cascading toxicity with high levels of glyphosate and herbicides that perturb the protein structures within that cell. And so I think it's really this perfect storm for all of you listening. You know, it's, it's easy to, to walk away saying, oh, I heard 5G causes this, or I heard glyphosate causes this. It's much more, I hope you're walking away with a bigger picture of this is that uh, it's that beautiful symphony of events that are happening to create a human body that Cindy was recognizing a bit ago. That is really what we're talking about. And it takes a perfect storm of toxicity, a massive screw up of human behavior to get us to the point of disease and disorder that we have today. And so I hope all of you are walking away with a little bit of, of just dumbstruck awe of how did we get here? Like, why did we walk away from nature this far? Why did we divide ourselves from nature from our cooking pans to the air we breathe, to the, the food we eat, to the water systems we've contaminated? Why, how did we do that? And it was probably because we were so confident that human was more important than everything else, but that we disregarded the, 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 the smallest among us. We disregarded the invisible microbiome. We disregarded and in fact, demonized the viruses and the bacteria for generations. And we have generations of scientists that are trying to, uh, or maybe not even trying yet, but have to make this leap to this new era. And we know scientific re revolution is slow and it's frustratingly slow. And uh, when we make massive new breakthroughs, like, oh my gosh, the human cell is not at the center of human health. It's actually the microbiome. That's going to take a hundred years for us to even start to get good traction at, at the previous rates of change in the scientific we don't have that much time as my, my fear. And so the reason we're having this event today and all of the previous global health initiatives and the future ones is to help bring you guys as consumers to an accelerated state of understanding because we believe that you guys will accelerate the behavior of your doctors faster than I can because you're gonna be demanding, hey, how do I take care of my innate immune system? Okay, you want me to have a vaccine that changes my adaptive immune system, which only kicks in weeks after I see a virus. So I don't understand how that's actually protecting me against anything. That's, that's a good question to ask. But more importantly, doc, how do I really improve my innate immune system? And if your doctor doesn't have those answers, encourage them to go look for them. And meanwhile, you go look for another team or you broaden your team to, to bring people in, nutritionists, the herbalists, like Dr. Calvin learned from. Uh, there's thousands of years of, of health data and health information and health practice that has supported the innate immune system in all of its levels before we even had a name for the innate immune system. Human experience has shown us that we have a beautiful relationship to this nature. Uh, so I appreciate all of the questions and, and going through here, uh, but we do need to wrap up. I want to turn it over to last thoughts, starting with you, Dr. Cowden. Yeah. I, uh, I want to say one more thing about uh, the the importance of the uh, nutrition on the immune system. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Leanne Keneally has the largest integrated medicine practice in the United States. And uh, she, she sees 50% uh, of her patients are can advanced cancer patients who have failed chemotherapy and radiation. And uh, the rest of them are uh, equally chronically ill. And nobody can get into her office immediately. So they all call the office and get on the schedule. And this receptionist says, Dr. K Dr. Keneally and her team are gonna want you to be on these nutrients and clean water and clean food between now and when you come in. And the nutrients are vitamin C, vitamin D3, magnesium, 
zinc, and iodine, Lugol of iodine. And so between March 1st and December 1st of, the, of this past year, uh, she was seeing, she and her team were seeing 800 to 1,000 patients per week. And they estimated that they should have seen at least 20 COVID deaths in their office. And they should have seen hundreds of COVID cases in their office, but they did not see any deaths. And they only saw one COVID case, which, which resolved quickly with intravenous vitamin C. So uh, it's an anecdote, but it's a pretty powerful anecdote with 30,000 patients in the study. <laughs> so uh, we, we would say it'd be good to be on vitamin C, vitamin D3, magnesium, zinc, and iodine if you want to try to prevent illness. Uh, if, you if you live in a toxic world and you eat the standard American degenerative diet. You know, the, the only other, only other uh, thing I would say is, uh, is learn more about homeopathy. Uh, homeopathy is a powerful tool. And uh, Dr. Uh, Isaac Golden published an article in the American Journal of Homeopathic Medicine in uh, May of 2019, and it was a study using homeoprophylaxis to prevent illness, eight potentially fatal illnesses in 250 million patient years. So we're talking about a massive study in three different countries. And he found that the homeoprophylaxis reduced the incidence of illnesses by 90% on average compared to the people that did not get homeoprophylaxis. So we're talking about a $3 treatment, a $3 treatment that it works equally as well as or better than vaccines, but without any adverse effects, no side effects. So I'm not against vaccines, I'm just for, for homeoprophylaxis. And, and this has been done in this recent pandemic. And so uh, there's a province in India that um, as soon as it began, rolled out a homeoprophylaxis uh, project to their entire uh, population. Uh, do, you have, do you have details on that? Yeah, yeah. They had one thirtieth the incidence of death in that province compared to the United States, one thirtieth as much. And the, yeah. the, the, Cuban, the Cuban doctors did homeoprophylaxis there in 5 million patients preventing COVID you know, COVID-19. And there was 6.3 million patients in their control group that did not get the homeoprophylaxis. And there was a 94% reduction in COVID-19 in the group that got homeoprophylaxis. So these work on the innate immune system. These work on, you know, helping the body to recognize something foreign and doing something about it naturally. The exciting thing about supporting the innate immune system for all of you to walk away from is this isn't about you know, preventing a single virus. There's 10 to the 31 viruses now estimated in the air that I'm breathing. Uh, there's 10 to the 31 viruses in the seawater. There's another 10 to the 30 viruses estimated in, in the soils of our, our systems underneath our feet. We are in a sea of genetic information and our body is constantly deciding how to keep us in relationship. I love, you know, Peter, your description of, of this filter rather than this, this war going on. We are, it's a filter for us to be able to interact and be in fellowship with mother nature. And so when we talk about a homeoprophylaxis that supports the innate immune system, our vitamin C, zinc, all these other ones that, that support lines of defense within that innate immune system, lines of filtration, what we're talking about is supporting your, against all health threats and not just, you know, we're not here to, to prevent a pandemic. That's ridiculous. One out of 10 to the 31 viruses, that's not what you need protection from you need to be in healthy relationship to all 10 to the 31. And that's where I think integrated medicine and support of the innate immune system gets really exciting. What we've learned from the military studies with flu vaccine is if we give the flu vaccine, the chance of that population getting coronavirus the next year goes up. And so does six other respiratory vac uh, viruses. And so when we screw with the immune system through artificial mechanisms, not only do we fall short of preventing that, the flu vaccine has never prevented any flu. It, it decreases symptoms by a few things, uh, by a few hours. And, and so in the same way, as we move towards, you know, trying to combat other viruses with vaccines, we're gonna find out that if we don't allow the innate immune system's involvement in our relationship to these viral proteins, we're gonna miss the opportunity for intelligent design to happen, for intelligent relationship to really unfold. And so I hope you all are walking away without a lot of the questions that you walked in with, because a lot of the questions that we see with you know, over 700 questions or whatever came pouring in, most of them are, well, what should I do about this? Or how does it relate to masks? Or how does it relate to the virus? Or how does it relate to the vaccine? I hope you're walking away with the realization of, 
the native immune system figured out how to keep biology before humanity. It, it figured out how to keep mammals. And before mammals, it, ha it figured out how to keep protozoa in relationship to 10 to the 31 viruses. This is the biology we're made within. We should sit here in a state of awe and respect for the intelligent design of the human body. And when we go about a pharmaceutical intervention and whether it be a vaccine or a drug or anything else, we should not be at all surprised when that falls short of anything that the biology would naturally do. How could it? It, it, it has, we've been exploring this, this mRNA investigation just for a few months, you know, short period of time of human history, this glimpse. How could that possibly compare to 4 billion years of biologic intelligence baked into this planet that we live in? How could it possibly be baked into the 200,000 years that we have developed relationship with that microbiome as, as humanity? And so I hope you walk away with a sense of awe and a deep sense of appreciation to each of our, our, our panelists today. Thank you all. Any last comments from the group? I think, Zach, I would just say, um we need to let go of our superiority complex that somehow we're better able to cope with toxins than other species. And I get a lot of eye rolls that from my colleagues that it's, it's bad, but, um, but I never get eye, ro eye rolls from the youth. I, I think they know better than anyone. They can see the hand that they've been dealt and uh, we owe it to them to be a little bit more humble about our place in, in all of this and do better than what we're doing. Beautiful. Empower the younger generations to, to, to pursue their own curiosity and scientific discovery and in, in, in who we are. Any last comments? I love that. Finally, I want to invite all of you to re-engage throughout the next couple of days and weeks uh, with the content that we've been producing around this event. I think it's really critical for you all to really start to wrap your head around this innate immune system's beauty and how important it is to your family. And without, I think, additional review, Everything that's, that we've covered today is gonna to have a tendency to spark your interest, but have a hard time sticking. It usually takes us three to five times to hear anything before it really starts to get into our cellular matrix. So that it becomes understanding, so that it becomes something that you can react to. So many of you are, are smartly asking, what do I do about the vaccine? Should I take the vaccine? Should I not take the vaccine? As you know, the regulatory agencies and the world at large in this bizarre way that it's functioning today is really editing and, and frankly, you know, working very hard to suppress anything but the current narrative. And so in the interest of letting this material have its full potential, I'm not here to tell you what to do with your decision for you, your children, and everything else, but I instead appeal to your common sense, appeal to your innate intelligence that you have within you that is gonna make you understand whether or not you were prepared for this moment in history. Uh, do you have the intelligence of the immune system, the innate immunity within you to be in relationship to the environment around you? Does the virome, including coronaviruses, in fact, have an important role in the human immune system and the health beyond? Does sickness itself play a role in our vitality? Does a febrile illness actually improve outcomes ultimately? Uh, is fever a critical way in which we prevent cancer and the rest? These are crucial things that I want you to really take home and think about. Have we misdefined the whole human experience in the, in the you know, claim of public health to justify more and more technology, to justify more and more billions of dollars to be printed out of nowhere and handed over to these pharmaceutical industries to speed innovation for what end we have no idea. And so I appeal to your common sense and to your innate knowingness and, and encourage you to make the decision that feels best for you. If you're gonna pursue the vaccine and everything else, Make sure that you're doing everything you can to improve your innate immune system's function because, again, that's old science that would suggest that the adaptive immune system and the antibodies that would come uh, perhaps as a secondary reaction to the proteins that this vaccine is going to induce in your body to have any prevention at all. The CDC, NIH, everybody, the WHO is very vehement right now that you don't know if you're protected at all from this vaccine. So please keep wearing your mask and social distancing, all these things that they're telling you. They're admitting that they have no idea if this is gonna actually balance your relationship with the coronavirus and if they have no idea what its implications are for global health. And so it is a guess at best uh, as to what's gonna happen when this thing whole, all this goes down. So if you choose to do the vaccine, make sure you, that doesn't check off the, oh, I'm healthy and, and vital again, around the virome at large. You have no idea if that's going to benefit anything. If it did benefit you, it would be the very first time in history that a, a vaccine has actually changed in a beneficial way your relationship to viruses as a whole. 
And so um, we may get lucky, we may not, that could happen, but the 99.9% .9 likelihood is that we are gonna again, fall short of mimicking the true genius of creative uh, capacity of life that's formed our innate immune system to be in relationship to this virus around us. And so in my appeal, I welcome you to more data, re-engage, uh, ZachBushMD.com, the innate immune system there. Call to action for you to participate in this information stream and this effort. Uh, you can help support the Global Health Initiative. The Global Health Education effort is uh, simply a GoFundMe site that I'm trying to kickstart uh, more and more funds to get more and more activation of, of the uh, greatest minds in this industry to start to be able to reach you directly, not behind paywalls and everything else. I, I'm hopeful that the whole world can start to see this information in real time. If you haven't dove into some of our previous uh, events, please go review, especially the sleep one, which is critical to your innate immune system function. If you're not getting good quality sleep, your immune system is compromised. And, so, and that has been true for the vast majority of people that have showed up in our clinic with coronavirus related symptoms. It was following a period of, of chronic or, or really acute sleep deficiencies. And so revisit the sleep uh, hour and a half that we did with Dr. Cummings and I You've got to get that piece of it down. These are practical ways you can stay engaged. Uh, if you don't have an integrated medicine team around you, you can look into the Intrinsic Health Series, which is a program that's sprung out of our clinic after the 10 years of our efforts, we uh, realized we could take this, uh, this show on the road and not just to impact one patient at a time in my exam room, but start to impact thousands. And so we would invite you to that uh, four week group, which is the, the Community Connect, uh, where you go through uh, eight, uh, member uh, coaching uh, sessions with a, with a group of eight, uh, or the one-on-one -on -one experience, which runs for eight weeks and intensive on how to apply these, these features in your life and how to really process the transformation that occurs in your body as you really dive into the fundamental foundation of the innate immune systems, which are everything from how to breathe correctly, to how to fast, to how to eat, to how to exercise, these fundamentals in human biology that has become the hallmark of health in our clinic over the last decade. And so the Intrinsic Health Series is there for you. You can engage through the ZachBushMD.com website or uh, TheMClinic.com uh, to get more information there. In addition, uh, I just want to open up the possibility of your participation in Farmer's Footprint. We are really trying to change this agricultural intersection between human health and the ecosystems at large, uh, visit us at farmersfootprint.us or farmersfootprint, uh, or I'm sorry, projectbiome.org uh, for some of the, the far reaching efforts that we're making there. Thank you all again for your participation today. I'm excited to continue uh, to bring you more and more data in the weeks to come to help you make these critical decisions of 2021 the most stress-free experience that we can and to really help you become an epicenter of change in your community. Thank you again for joining. We thank you to the 5,000, 6,000 that we're on over the course of the, the, the two hours. And we thank you to the, to the 20,000 others that will be joining us later. And uh, each of you in your own homes, communities, we see you as a force of nature. You showed up right now. Uh, that means you're part of the revolution of human thought and human experience. And we just honor each of you in being uh, a, a curious agent of your community that you even tied into this two hours suggests that you're uh, part of the curiosity that will drive us into a healthier future where our children and our planet uh, can come in line together to create a healthy humanity, perhaps a healthier humanity than we've ever seen before, uh, as we give up our, our, uh, our belief system in the, in the fight and start to accept that we are the result of nature, not against that nature. And so thank you for joining us. Uh, all of you have the healthiest of days and, uh, and you're ahead.